So I'm Christina Warner. I'm a family and animal protection barrister at Goldsmith Chambers, and I have Stargardt's disease. Stargardt's is juvenile macular degeneration. It um, is a degenerative condition that causes sight loss. And the way I describe it to people is, it's how older people lose their eyesight, but happening to younger people. So I'm not the first in my family to have this condition. My brother has the same condition. He was diagnosed about 10, 15 years ago, um, and it's been quite a steep decline for him. Um, I got my diagnosis at the beginning of this year after noticing that my eyesight was, um, was diminishing quite quickly. Um, but I'm now very open about the challenges that I face as someone with a non-visible disability. So I am still um, on first glance, able body passing, but um, it soon becomes apparent to those around me that there's some difficulties that I face with navigating around an unknown location. Um, but that's what it is to, to have the visual impairment that I do. I did a degree, I did English law and Spanish law. And at that time, my eyesight was, was absolutely fine. I had a driving license. It was, it was as every able-bodied person. Um, and it was really, I'd say, five years ago or so that I noticed that something was happening, but it was nowhere near as severe as it is now. And knowing what I knew about my brother's diagnosis, I knew it was highly likely that I had the same condition. Um, so now that I am a barrister in chambers, I've been very keen to maintain my practice. And the way that I've done that is by getting the support that I need from my colleagues in Chambers, who've been fantastic. Uh, the head of Chambers is very keen to hear uh, more about disabled practitioners mm -hmm. um, and it, make sure that we're as openly represented as possible, as well as the more practical side, reaching out to other barristers with disabilities. I've found uh, an immense sense of support and solidarity with them, be them, um, barristers that have mobility challenges or neurological or sensory challenges like myself um, that's been a great resource for me sharing stories sharing ideas and um, finding that that sense of of common ground with all of us has been really inspiring and tell us some of the reasonable adjustments you've sort of mm -hmm. got in place now so you can do your job yeah so in terms of my job, I went through the access to work scheme, which is challenging. Um, and I think you it's good to speak to other people who have similar um, disabilities so that you know what it is that you're you're seeking. So you can go in with a clear idea of what it is that you're seeking the access to work to to help you with. I have a support worker. Um, I use IT as every other lawyer does. Everything's digitalized now. And I use a lot of um, reading software so that documents are read to me. And I actually find I absorb the information a lot easier when it's um, audio rather than visual, which naturally makes sense with my vision being compromised. Mm. Um, I also find certain organization techniques are really good for me. So um, I still have very good color spectrum. So um, cross-referencing documents by color, I find really useful as well. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when you've got to go to court, for instance, I mean, a, a lot of it's been online recently, yeah. but it's going back to court now. What, what sort of adjustments do you need there? So I now very proudly will tell the court staff that I have a disability because I know I'm representing more than just myself. Yeah. I'm representing other barristers that have disabilities and we should uh, be very visible as practitioners that have challenges. But I let the court staff know and I have my badge um, that shows that I'm visually impaired. And by letting the court staff know, um, they tell the judge. So they will tell the judge. So what usually happens is I'm brought into the courtroom first so that I can choose where it is that I sit mm -hmm. so that I'm within as close as I can be adhering to the previous social distancing um, to the judge so that I can see or uh, the witness. So if I'm doing any questioning of a witness, any cross-examination, just so that the logistics work within the courtroom as well as still staying close to my clients so I can take instructions. Um, and court staff have found, have been very patient. Everyone is under pressure and I very much appreciate that. And I have my support worker with me as well. So she's my, she's the, she's my eyes. Right. 
she keeps an eye on what's happening around me as well. So does your support worker support you in getting to and from places? Yes. So we we try and have a plan in place um, as soon as I'm able to um, provide that to her. So just knowing whether or not I have any urgent issues that have come in last minute, any cases that have come in urgently, or a case that's been in my diary for a while, she will assist me with the organisation of documentation. But at the same time, uh, the logistics of travelling to and from work, that um, she assists me with that also. Now, you've, all, you've told me, as we were chatting before, that you've also had to adjust your living arrangements. Yes. So tell us yeah. about that, what you've had yeah. to do there. So uh, lighting is really important to me to try and preserve, to, to preserve the sight that I have, as well as not strain my eyes um, any more than I need to. Um, and lighting has been fantastic. So I, my dad actually put a light by my front door so that I can get the key into the lock because that's always a bit of a challenge yeah. and um, lighting in my kitchen as well so that I'm able to um, cook for myself and cut vegetables and cut food up and things like that so that's great and also a light um, on the outside of the build of like the out the rear of the flat that I'm in so that I can see properly outside as well. Mm. Get your cat in and out, I suppose. Yeah, yeah he is. He's sleeping. <laughs> His little cameo role here, little VIP. <laughs> so, yeah, so that I have two and they're both, they keep me on my toes, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> You're very upbeat about it all. How, how have you adjusted? How has your self-esteem been over all of this? Because you've moved from someone who was not a disabled person to now someone who is. So how, how have you made that, that transition? Um, I would be lying if I said that it was easy. It's been... It's definitely been tough, but I feel like I've lived part of it through watching what happened with my brother. Um, and it, there was a lot of grief, a sadness, anger, I think as well when it's a genetic condition. Who, who are you meant to be angry at? Who, who are you angry at? Yourself, doctors, your parents? Who? There's no one to be angry at. There's no one to aim that upset and frustration at. And... Um, there was a period of real sadness and depression as well as I think a lot of disabled people, regardless of whether or not it's from birth or it manifests itself later or through accident or injury. I can imagine that that seems to be a common theme amongst a lot of us. But what I have found is that now I am so proudly part of a community of superhuman beings. I think that those with disabilities, we we embody what the human race is capable of doing. We adapt like, like few others are able to, to the obstacles that are placed before us. And that's the sense of community and the community that I now represent fills me with a lot of pride. And that's what's really kept me going. And the, the brutal honesty of, um, some friends that have disabilities who have just very clearly told me that you need to get busy with living your life live your life crack on do what you have to do and enjoy it because things could always be so much worse but it takes a long time to get there it takes a long time to to find that to regain that self-worth i think and and knowing that your life may not be how it was before but it doesn't mean it's any less it's just different I don't think it's really affected in terms of relationships. Mm. Um, in terms of friendships, I have a phenomenal group of friends who are everything to me. And mm. they are, they're, they're so open to wanting to help me, but at the same time, ensure that I maintain my independence. So they having that two way conversation of what do you need from me as your friend to help you and me being honest. Yes, I can do that. Or no, I can't do certain things. That transparency is I feel that that's really strengthened the friendships that I have. Um, and just knowing that my friends are there when they subtly if we're crossing a road, they may subtly hold my hand or yeah. um, just help me pour a glass of water. It's things like this that still allow me to keep my dignity and keep my independence. But at the same time, they I know that they're there. That um, is priceless. Money just can't buy that. And that has really come through since my diagnosis or since I've been open and saying I can't do certain things. That's why I think it's important that those are established in professions that we pave the way for those that are that are coming up behind us. Because I know that there are students with disabilities that are at law school that are wanting to qualify, that have obstacles, 
that are having to manage their disabilities rather than manage their studies and that's unacceptable they should be put on a level playing field with students with able-bodied students so that they have exactly the same chances and that's what myself and colleagues that I've met through my diagnosis that's what we're aiming to do to raise awareness of the need within the legal profession of inclusivity and the and raising awareness of the visibility and representation of those with disabilities that are practicing lawyers barristers solicitors it's essential because that then lays the foundation for people for young students that are trying to come through okay and last thing is there anything you want to say to those in power who make the laws and so on about how people's life could be made easier as disabled people um i had a conversation with uh, another disabled person last week and i said everyone at some point everyone at some point will experience a form of disability so it may be that you break a limb and you're out of action for six weeks it may be that you get um an ear infection an eye infection whatever it might be so one of your senses or your mobility will be compromised in some way just imagine that and imagine that being long term not medium term long term that is your life and for everyone that thinks that they can't relate to anyone with a disability, they don't understand it, draw from your own life experiences, because it could happen to anyone and it could happen to you. And I think those in power need to understand that we are here, we are visible and we're not going anywhere. We are as unique as our disabilities as we are individuals and we, we need to be acknowledged and we must be included. Our voices count. Our government has refused to uh, implement the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons yeah. with Disabilities. The UN Committee have made endless criticism of the British government. What is there that we can do to, to uh, push and secure the human rights position of disabled people, do you think? Um, I've been doing a lot of reading into, um, well, I actually used to work at the International Criminal Court as a prosecutor a few years ago. And there's a lot of there's talk going on in the background as to the potential of making um, the targeting, the deliberate targeting and persecution of those with disabilities, a freestanding war crime under the Rome statute, which is a governing piece of legislation at the ICC. There needs to be much more awareness of the global issue of disability. 15% of the world's population has a, has a visible or non-visible disability. We aren't going anywhere. And this will continue. We need care across all fields, access to education, access to justice, access to care. It's, it's not just a one size fits all. There needs to be a much greater awareness, inclusivity, both in the micro and the macro across all levels. And it's just not happening. And it's shameful. I've been doing a lot of reading as well about how people with disabilities are having to spend their their meager meager benefits on care yeah. it's just out it's out it's outrageous it's a disgrace that people that those of us that already have challenges and obstacles that we face day to day regardless of what our condition may be that we're then having to sacrifice what we're entitled to just to be able to live a, a semi-independent life if at all that is it's disgraceful and yeah it, it's heartbreaking and I know a lot of barristers feel, well, all of the barristers that I've spoken to who have disabilities feel the same way I do.